Hello, hello everybody, this is Tiptop MTG here today with another Magic the Gathering video. In today's video, I am going to be breaking down some partners from Commander Legends and talking about who they best partner with. So Commander Legends was just released, and you know, it was met with a lot of excitement, a lot of feedback, a lot of everything, and I have done a bunch of videos covering the set as a whole, covering spoilers, covering my favorite new commanders, but a really big part of it is the partner mechanic. And one thing a lot of people have questions about is, hey, I like this commander, and it has partner, who should I partner it with? So in today's video, I'm going to be looking at all of the rares and mythics that have partner. Now, originally, this video was going to be every single partner, but a couple things came across, um, you know, and why I'm not doing that. First off, this video would either have to be two parts or close to an hour long, and I don't think many people are going to want to see that. On top of that, I m don't really cover Commander as often, so dedicating that much time to a video for a format that isn't as covered on my channel, you know, doesn't make as much sense, because I don't have as much knowledge into Commander, especially because a lot of the uncommons are very, very specific and not as, say, powerful or as fun to talk about as the rares and mythics from, like, a more casual perspective. And then also, the biggest reason is, when I'm talking about what works well with, say, a Chroma, who is a mythic in the set, um, I'm going to be talking about partners. So I'm going to be talking about common, not commons, I'm going to be talking about uncommon partners that work well with her. And those partners would then have their own kind of section where I talk about them, and I'm going to say, oh, a Chroma works well with them. So you're going to get, like, lots of repetition where I say, a Chroma works well with, you know, Sakashima which actually is a rare, but let's say a Chroma works well with some random uncommon, and then you would also get to that uncommon and say, well, this uncommon works well with the Chroma, and so we get a lot of repetition, and this kind of cuts down on that as well. So if you guys really want to see me talk about the uncommons, let me know, I will do it if, I, if there's enough people who want to see that, but I don't think there will be. But again, I might be wrong. Let me know by leaving a comment or a like on this video. So yeah, why don't we just jump right into this? So the first commander we are talking about is Akroma. Akroma Vision of Ixidor is a 7 cost white 6-6 six, six legendary creature angel with flying first strike vigilance and trample, so a pretty beefy creature. It says at the beginning of each combat until end of turn each other creature you control gets plus one plus one if it has flying, plus one plus one if it has first strike, and so on for double strike, death touch, haste, hexproof, indestructible, lifelink, menace, protection, reach, trample, vigilance, and partner. So essentially, you know, you play this and then you have say a 1-1 one, one with trample and haste, it's going to become a 3-3 three, three with trample and haste because of this ability. And so you're going to want to generally play a lot of creatures that have keywords or that give keywords. And because it has partner, it kind of lets you choose your color combination. So for some of the commanders that are a little bit more narrow and maybe don't have an obvious choice for partner, uh, I sometimes did put things in here that are just here because, well, you might want that color. Uh, and for instance, a seven cost white commander, white doesn't do that great with ramping. So maybe you want to throw it with green. So let's, let's talk about four commanders that I think work well. So first we have a rogue rock. And I I think this is going to be a very popular combination. First off, it's Boros. Boros really cares about attacking and a Chroma clearly wants you to attack and wants you to attack and win. And so having Rogrok out, he will become a 4-5 first strike menace trample and he costs zero he has four out of you know four of the commander words and you're generally going to want to want to put rogue Rock in a deck that cares about boosting up creatures so that you can boost him up and a chroma is going to boost up creatures and cares about uh keywords and rogue has the keywords and cares about being boosted up so it's a very you know popular choice i i think it'll be uh we saw it in a episode of game nights and it worked really well there so i think that this will be definitely popular popular one. Now, a face you will probably see a lot in this video is Sakashima, who's a 4 cost 3-1 that basically can enter the battlefield as a copy of any of your creatures, and it makes it so the legend rule doesn't apply to you. So you can have Sakashima come down as a copy of a Chroma. And so the idea is there, you have this 6-6 six, six that's going to boost all your creatures, but a Chroma doesn't boost herself. So if you can get two Chromas, not only are your creatures going to get like double the ability, for instance, um, if you had Rogra, which you couldn't because of, you know, color identity, but say you did, it wouldn't get plus four plus four, it'd get plus eight plus eight because they both do the effect. And it also means that Sakashima is going to get boosted up by a Chroma, and a Chroma is going to be boosted up by Sakashima, uh, which would then make both of them 11-11s. So yeah, I definitely think Sakashima works well. Generally, if you're putting a commander in a deck, you want that effect. And so having just two of that commander is really good. Now, I would say one disadvantage compared to something like Rogue Rock is that you can't, you have to play Sakashima second. 
which means that you kind of are not playing your commander until very late in the game, versus Rogue Rock kind of gives you an early game play with him, and then later on you play a Chroma. So I think that's one kind of issue with it. Another one is Phallus Shadow Cat Familiar. Um, this one just kind of gives commanders menace and death touch. So it's a three cost two, two, but it will have menace, death touch, and partner. So that's going to be a five, five menace, death touch partner. Not bad. Um, it also then gives a chroma menace and death touch. And so she'll be a flying first strike, vigilance, trample, menace, and death touch. And the main reason I'm putting this here is because first strike mixed with trample mixed with death touch is deadly, especially on a six, six. Essentially, they have to block with six creatures plus enough to kill a chroma. So they need seven flying creatures and they all have to be big enough to kill a chroma. Um, so that is a pretty big task. And the trample also means, because trample and death touch means you can just assign one combat damage. So if this thing's a 6-6, six, six, they block with a 1-1 one, one flyer or they block with even a 10-12-12, you're going to deal one damage to the 12-12 and five to their face. So I think, you know, giving it menace and death touch, and actually it has menace. They can't just block with one creature. Uh, and so you're going to be killing at least two creatures if they want to block. If they don't want to block, they're taking a lot of damage. It is a pretty big combination, and obviously the commander caring about keywords is going to like this card. And then Kamal, this one is mostly here for his second ability, but he's an 8 cost 5-5, five, five, and it says at the beginning of combat on your turn, creatures you control get plus 3, plus 3, and gain trample. So first off, you're going to care about having creatures out, right? And so you know, with a chroma, you're going to want to be able to boost up a lot of other creatures, and Kamal's also going to want to boost up a lot of creatures, but it also gives them trample, so if you have both a chroma and Kamal out, you're actually giving each thing plus four, plus four, and trample, assuming they didn't already have it, and then also you can pay two and turn your lands into one ones with vigilance, indestructible, and haste, so if that's, if you activate this ability and then a chrome was on the battlefield they all become four fours with vigilance indestructible and haste and actually they become seven sevens because of Ka of kamal so you can kind of pay two mana to turn a land into a seven seven trample vigilance indestructible haste so yeah i also think kamal's a pretty good choice i would say rat rogue rock uh, and Kamal are probably my two favorites here. Kamal is really good because he adds green, which then lets you ramp up to a chroma much, much faster, whereas the other colors aren't so great at doing that. Either way, let's move on. That was a lot of time on that one. Let's talk about Livio Oathsworn Sentinel, who's a two cost two, two, and you can pay two mana to choose another target creature. Its controller may have it exiled with an Aegis counter on it. And then you can pay three and tap and return all exiled creatures with Aegis counters on them to their owner's control. So you can either use this as a political tool against your opponent saying, hey, I can protect this from a board wipe or I can flicker it for you. You can do it to say if someone robs something of yours, um, or if something gets robbed, maybe you trick people, you, you can like trick people and say, hey, yeah, I'll return it, and then you don't. You can also just use it to flicker your own stuff. It's a bit expensive for that, but it is a very interesting card in my opinion. So let's talk about what cards work well with it. So first, I think Kodama of the East Tree is a pretty good choice here because, well, Kodama is going to reward you whenever another permanent enters the battlefield by letting you put something with equal or lesser converted mana cost onto the battlefield. So you can use Livio to flicker a 10 CMC card let's say the Great Henge, which is a 9 drop, uh, that you can cast for like 2, which is already really good with Kodama, and then you can flicker it, actually it only lets you do creatures, let's say you have some creature, sorry, and it's a really expensive creature that gets its cost reduced or something, or even just a really expensive creature, you can use Livio to kind of flicker it, re-trigger Kodama's ability to then re-put stuff on the battlefield, so that's a pretty awesome little combo there. Nadir, Agent of the Dus Dusknell, is okay, it, it has the ability, whenever it leaves the battlefield, to create a number of 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature tokens equal to its power, so if you can keep flickering that with Livio, you are going to end up with a decent amount of elves. Now, you're generally going to want to put Nadir in a kind of green deck because obviously elves are going to have a lot more support there, but you also have the ability with Nadir to uh, up his power by making tokens leave the battlefield. So you can kind of keep flickering him to make tokens and then you can pay two mana to kind of make those tokens leave the battlefield to boost up Nadir to make more tokens. So it's this weird little Orsav token dump kind of card and I think it's not going to be one of the more popular ones, and I think it will be a little overlooked. I think it could be very, very powerful, though. Um, of course, you do have the issue of Nadir costing 6. And then we have Sakashima. Of course, if you're going to want to copy things, this is going to be pretty good. The ability to return them to the battlefield is a tap ability, which means that Sakashima is going to want to 
you know, it can become Livio as well and make it so you can return things twice. You can exile everything with it, return them into the battlefield, exile everything, and then use Sakashima to return them. On top of that, if you flicker Sakashima itself, you can have it re-enter the battlefield as a different creature. So say you play Livio, then you play Sakashima as a copy of Livio or the copy of anything. You can then flicker it later on with Livio and have it re-enter as your biggest threat. Uh, so I think that's a pretty good choice. And then we have Elena, who is going to let you tap to add a red equal to the greatest power among creatures you control that have entered the battlefield this turn. This allows you to maybe flicker something with really big power, or there are some creatures, for instance, that kill themselves at your end step, like they're like seven ones for two, but they kill themselves at your end step. You can play it, hit your opponent with it if it's going to survive, tap Elena for five mana, and then you can exile it with Livio so that it stays exiled. And then at your next turn, re have it re-enter the battlefield using its ability. You can maybe swing with it again, or at least get Elena to re-trigger. And so you kind of get this loop of these creatures that are supposed to die at their end step because they're super big. They don't actually die because you're saving them with Livio, and Elena is actually really liking that. So yeah, on top of that, if you can get a haste enabler, you can maybe do something with infinite mana with like a mana filter. So that's something kind of interesting there. Let's move on to the next one. We have Elegith Crossroads Augur. This is a six cost five six that's gonna let you draw cards whenever you would scry them. So if you have a spell that says scry two instead, that basically says draw two. So what is going to work well with that? Well, first we have Sayani Eye of the Storm. This one's a pretty obvious one, I think, in my opinion, but it's a four cost, three, two. And whenever it attacks, you scry X, where X is the number of attacking creatures with flying. So first off, it's a one of the partners that lets you scry. So that's a pretty big deal already. But on top of that, it's caring about the number of flying attacking creatures. And would, would look at it, uh, Elgeth is a flying creature. So I could totally see this in like a mono blue scry flying deck. Um, first off, Sayani and he can go on the battlefield earlier than Elgith. Uh, that's one thing I like about expensive partners is that you can kind of have one partner for the early game and then one for later on. And so Sayani can be a pretty good payoff for your scrying and maybe not for your scrying, but it can be a pretty big payoff for your flying creatures and then let you scry to maybe get your lands and your ramp to get up to Elgith. So I think that works really well. I think some better ones are going to be Elgith and Thrasios, who lets you scry one, then reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, otherwise draw a card. So you're going to scry one, which is actually going to be draw a card. So you're going to pay four mana to draw a card, then you're going to reveal the top card of your library, and if it's a land, it goes on the battlefield. If it's not, draw a card. So essentially, you're going to pay four to draw two cards, and if it's a land, it actually just goes straight on the battlefield. Then we have Kaidel, Chosen of Crufix, which is just going to let you add colorless for each card you've drawn this turn. Uh, it is also in Simic, just like Thrasios, meaning that you can kind of have green in there. Green and blue is a very popular combination. And of course, you know, the first two kind of were scry engines. This one cares about how many, you know, cards you've drawn. So you need some other way to scry, but it is a payoff for the drawing that Elgith is doing. And then probably the weakest one here is Essior, Hardwing Familiar. This one just makes it so targeting your stuff costs more. And the reason I put this one, and this one may be a more budget option, is that Elgith is kind of an expensive commander, and Blue has a bit of a hard time ramping, so it is a pretty decent one. Of course, another advantage to partner, like I said before, is that if you just want it to be blue-black, because there's a lot of blue-black cards at Scry that you like, you can go and add anything, and the familiars are actually really good for just adding colors, because they just add a little bit to your card. Uh, so I keep that in mind. I think Elgith is really good. Now you'll notice Sakashima, the one that copies things, is not here. That is because this is not saying when you scry draw that many, it's saying if you would scry. So it's replacing the scry effect, which means having two of them doesn't actually give you double the draw. So keep that in mind as well. Do not pair those two together. They don't work amazingly well. Speaking of Sakashima, we have Sakashima, who we've talked about a lot, just ETBs as another creature and makes it so the legend rule doesn't apply. So, are you ready for this? Sakashima works well with, I would say, these four creatures the best. So, Kodama of the East Tree, I think, is the biggest one here. And that is because, well, whenever a permanent enters the battlefield, you're putting down another permanent with equal or lesser converted mana cost. But the catch is, you can only do that if the permanent entered without this ability triggering. So you can't play a 5-drop into a 4-drop, into a 3-drop, into a 2-drop, because Kodama doesn't let you do that. But if you have Sakashima, you can play a 5-drop, you then get to put down 2, either 5, or 4, or 3, or 2, 1-drop. You get to put down 2 permanents, and then for each of those permanents, you get to put down a permanent, and then for each of those permanents, you get to put down a permanent, because they're not triggering with, quote, this ability, like Kodama says, they're triggering with the other one's abilities. Similarly, Krark is pretty good, because it's gonna let you maybe, um... 
It's going to, when you cast instants and sorceries, it is going to let you copy them or return them to your hand. You don't get a choice. It's random. And with Kushaka, Ka, Sakashima becoming a copy of Krark, you can have it either, like, there's, first off, you cast the spell, you have double the chance that you're actually going to get to cast it. Um, and actually, there's a high chance that, like, you copy the spell and return it to your hand. So now you're, like, paying the mana for the spell, casting it, and getting to keep the spell. So let's say I play opt, right? I play the opt, it gets copied, and then it gets bounced back to my hand. Well, now I'm still opting, and I still have the opt in my hand, and I can do that again. Now, of course, there is a chance that they both get bounced to your hand, and there is the chance that they both get copied. But honestly, uh, first off, the odds that they both get bounced is one in four. So one in four times, both spells are going to get bounced to your hand. That's kind of unfortunate. But the other times, it works out pretty well. You get yourself the card either back in your hand and you cast it, or you're paying like one mana to opt three times. So I think that works really well. Similarly, Kamal just has a pretty potent ability that's kind of expensive. Simic is also a very good color combination, although I would say Kodama is probably the better one. And then Vile Smasher the Fierce is going to deal damage whenever you cast expensive spells. Now, the disadvantage of doing this is that you don't have access to green, which a Vile Smasher really likes to have, because you want to be able to ramp fairly quickly. So that is a little bit of an unfortunate thing, but the fact that you can have two Vile Smashers is really good. You cast a 5-drop even, you are now dealing 5 damage to two people, or or even 10 damage to one, so I think that is really good. Next we have Sangir the Dark Baron. He is going to care about when creatures die, you're going to put counters on them, and when an opponent dies, you gain life equal to that player's life total uh, the turn they died. So if they went from 40 to 0 in one turn, you're going to gain 40 life. So what are you going to want to put this guy with? Well, things that care about either creature dying, giving you things that give you creatures, or things that care about counters. So Tevish Stats is a perfect commander to go with him because he creates tokens that can then die and then put counters on Sangir. He gives you the ability to sacrifice your creatures, whether it be Sengir himself, which you probably aren't doing, um, or just your little tokens, which then puts counters on Sengir and lets you draw cards, and then he has a splashy ultimate that really isn't super important, but in a deck that cares about plus one plus one counters and creatures dying, you may be running proliferate, which means it may be more likely that you get up to his ult. We have Ravos the Soul Tender, which is going to let you return cards from your graveyard to your hand every single turn, which means if you're sacrificing them to Sengir, you can bring them back and recast them, so pretty good there. It's also going to boost up your creatures, um, so that's pretty cool. We have Sakashima, again, if you're doing a strategy, you know, you may want to do double that strategy. And then Rayhan is going to care about whenever a creature you control dies or is put into the command zone. If it had plus one, plus one counters on them, you may put that many plus one, plus one counters on target creature. So for instance, if Sengir does die, with all these counters on it, they can be moved away, or if, like, Rayhan dies, you can move them onto Sangir, um, in which case, like, Sangir is probably getting, like, five plus one plus one counters from that, so, yeah, and that's, of course, if you want black and green, which I think are the better of the two colors, maybe, uh, yeah, I think black and green are probably going to be the better colors here, if you could do black, green, and white, that would be also pretty good, so, yeah, keep an eye out for that, I think Rayhan and Tevish Stats are probably the two best ones here. Next we have Tevish Stats himself. He is, of course, going to work with Sengir. I kind of explained what he did in the last one. He's going to work with Ravos. They're going to play in very much the same space. I think Tevish Stats is a much better commander. However, he also works really well with Kodama because his, his plus two, his plus two puts two zero ones on the battlefield, which may not seem like a huge deal, but if you activate that while Kodama's on the battlefield, that can be like putting two lands into play, um, putting zero cost down, but mostly it's the ability to kind of ramp you in that way, uh, and it's also, Kodama is going to let you put down lots of creatures, and so you need to refill your hand. You can do that with Tevish Sats. You can also um, what, sacrifice the things you're putting down to draw more cards and, you know, kind of loop that way. And then Rograk is kind of interesting as well. Um, just because he is a smaller creature that you may be able to sacrifice multiple times. For instance, he's going to cost zero, then two, then four. So you can sacrifice him to draw that extra card with Tevish Sats. All right, so next let's move on to Jeska, Thrice Reborn. It's a three-cost red legendary planeswalker. Jeska, zero loyalty, and it enters the battlefield with a number of loyalty counters equal to the amount of times you've cast a commander from the command zone. And then you can pay zero and basically choose a creature, and if that creature would deal damage to an opponent until end of turn, it deals triple that damage instead. So if you put this on like a 5-5 five five and it hits an opponent, you're dealing 15. And then you can minus X to deal X damage to each of up to three creatures. So if it even enters with two loyalty, you can minus one it to kind of deal three damage divided among three creatures. So, and it actually isn't even just creatures, it's also planeswalkers and players, so that can be a nice little finisher. 
So why don't we talk about the cards that work well with this? First off, we have Rogue Rock for a couple of reasons, actually. First off, it's really cheap, and so for the same way that Tevish Stats um, is going to kind of care about like being able to recast it by letting him, you sacrifice him, you are also going to care about the fact that Rogue Rock um, is built to kind of be built up with armor and uh, equipment, I guess is the word I'm looking for here, so that you know, he is going to, he, like, when you look at Rogue Rock, you think of two things. First off, commanders that care about how many times you cast commanders, which, you know, Jessica does, and commanders that want you to build up or have big creatures, or at least things that boost up things. So if you run this in an equipment deck, you boost him up to be a big first strike menace trampler, and then use the zero ability on him, even if he's just a 5-5, five, five, you're dealing 15 commander damage. So it works well in two ways. First off, the cheapness means that Jessica will almost always come down with at least two loyalty, and also the fact that he's clearly built to be boosted up by other means, whether it be equipment or enchantments. And similarly, we have Bruce Tarl, who is going to be a Boros, so he'll be in Boros instead of just Mono Red, and when it enters the battlefield or attacked, target creature you control gains double strike and lifelink until end of turn, so you can give something double strike and lifelink and then make it deal triple damage, which means that you're going to deal lots of damage. Like, if you put this on, say, a 3-3, it's going to deal, you know, 9 damage, then it's going to have double strike, so it's actually going to deal 18 damage, you're going to gain 18 life. Pretty, pretty good. And then we have Tana, the Blood Sower who, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you create that many plus one, pl that many one one sapperling creature tokens. Very simple, you know, you're going to hit an opponent for six if you triple the damage on it, and if that's the case, then you are going to make six one ones. But also, clearly with Tana, you're going to put things that boost up her power so that you can create extra tokens, maybe something that boosts up her power equal to the number of tokens you have, and then you mix that with Jessica's ability to, you know, amp up damage, and you get something pretty good. And then Kedis, Emberclaw Familiar, is going to let you kind kind of take your damage that you dealt to one person and deal it to everyone. So if you get through with that big creature, that 6-6 six, six, that you turned into an, basically an 18-18, or at least an 18-6 if it hits an opponent, you can then deal 18 to each opponent rather than just one, and that really helps with this kind of strategy of wanting to hit your opponent really hard. It helps you take down everyone at once, and it means you don't have to worry about attacking, because in order to get the zero ability off, you have to hit an opponent, which means you're going to want to attack the weakest player, but you really, you know, attacking the weakest player isn't an awful idea, but they're the weakest player, they're the least threatening to you, so, you know, you're also going to have maybe a harder time hitting the players who need to be killed, so this kind of lets you get around that by hitting the weakest player. Next, we have Krark the Thumbless. We talked a little bit about him. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, you flip a coin. If you win the flip, you copy the spell. If you lose the flip, you return the spell back to your hand. So, cards that work well is Elegith, Crossroads, Augur, mostly because you can combine this with spells that scry or draw cards, and you will get... Um, just more value off of it. Not my favorite combination. Generally, you're going to want this to be in Is It because that has the biggest payoffs. Generally, Krark is going to want to be in a lot of decks that care about when you cast instants and sorceries because you are going to want the value whether they are successfully cast or not. Because it's so random, you're going to want one of two things. You're either going to want a deck that cares about coin flipping or you're going to want a deck that cares about when you cast things. That way, when you cast a spell, even if it gets bounced back to your hand, you're still getting the value. If you got something that said when you cast a spell, draw a card, you cast a spell, it gets bounced back to your hand, well, you can cast it again. Or you cast a spell, it gets copied, now you get two of the spells. So you want to set up the deck in such a way that you will get a benefit either way, and so being an is it gives you the best chance of that. Another good one would be Ludovig, who kind of is just a good is it commander. It says at the beginning of each player's end step, that player may draw a card if a player other than you lost life this turn. Um, obviously just an is it deck that's going to disincentivize them hitting you as much. They're going to want to hit the, your opponents, which then means you have a little bit more room for error if you need to cast the spell and Krark doesn't work. Sakashima, we talked about that in the Sakashima part, so I'm not really going to talk about it here, but again, you're doubling your odds of successfully casting, and you have that chance of successfully casting and getting it back in your hand. And then we have Ghost of Ramirez de Pietro. It's a three-cost blue legendary creature spirit pirate, and it can't be blocked by creatures with toughness three or greater, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player, choose up to one target card in a graveyard that was discarded or put there from a library this turn. Put that card into its owner's hand. So definitely, this is not going in every Kark deck. It is just an interesting build, I thought, where it's like you're going to be discarding cards, uh, maybe a lot of spells that let you discard cards to draw cards, and then you can use Ghost of Pietro to kind of get those back. So it's definitely a more refined and specific deck, unlike something like Sakashima, which can be a general is it deck. But Ghost of Ramirez de, Pe de Pietro, I think, could be kind of interesting. 
And then we have Kamal. We talked a little bit about him, but things that I work, think work well with him are Timna the Weaver, because this is going to care about how many opponents you hit, and giving everything plus three, plus three, and trample is pretty good for hitting opponents. On top of that, it's giving you access to three colors. Um, white likes to attack as well with a lot of creatures, and so that works really well with Kamal. Uh, and then, of course, the fact that you can turn your lands into, like, really hard to block, or at least not beneficial, super beneficial to block helps with Timna. Uh, as well and it gives you a little bit of an early game start and some control color so i think it works really well similarly i talked about akroma and kamal a little bit um with the fact that you're boosting everything up makes a lot of sense we have sakashima and kamal which is just gonna give everything plus six plus six so that's pretty good as well uh, again the issue is you'd have to cast sakashima second after you cast kamal but you are in simic so you can ramp fairly quickly and i would say a more budgety option would be as as your ward wing familiar again you have an expensive command you want to make it a little bit harder to kill but again just add any color you want uh the reason i used the blue one here was because first off it's expensive but second simic seems to be one of the better color combinations right now all right and we have kodama of the east tree we talked about kodama and sakashima we talked about kodama and tevish Shats. we talked about kodama and livio but we have not talked about kodama and thrasios kodama and thrasios just really good combination here. I think the other three, or at least two of the other three, are pretty, are better in a lot of ways, but Thrasios is a powerhouse partner, and so matching him up with anything else that's just extreme value leads to an extremely powerful deck. If you can get lands off the top of your library, you may be able to put then lands from your hand and all sorts of things, and Thrasios can kind of give you the ability to just keep drawing cards for Kodama to activate. So yeah, I think those are the four best, although I did talk about it. Kodama is probably the most powerful partner in my opinion, and so it makes sense that it was talked about a lot with the other ones. So that is it for this video. I thought it was a lot of fun. It ended up being a little bit longer than I would have liked, but I am glad I got to talk in detail about all of these. I want to know your guys' thoughts. Did I miss a partner pairing that you thought was really awesome? Should I do more for the uncommons? Should I go look at the old partners and talk about what works well with them? Let me know all that in the comments down below. I will see you in the next one. Bye.